Hey everyone, Ryan here and welcome back to our Operative Dentistry series. In this video we will talk about the amalgam restoration. So we'll talk about what amalgam is made out of, when and how to use it in the clinic, and then associated toxicity and hazard risks. So the word amalgam means a mixture or a blend. An amalgam in our context is a mixture of liquid elemental mercury with another metal or metals. So dental amalgam is a mixture of mercury with more specifically a silver alloy. And one such combination of these two components is what's called the Eames ratio, which is 50% mercury and 50% metal alloy. So it's a one to one ratio between those two main components. Now the metal alloy can contain many different metals, but four metals in particular that I think you should know for the board exam. So silver is of course a necessity. Silver gives it its strength. Tin is actually most responsible for the corrosion factor, and corrosion is something we'll talk a little bit more later on in the video. Copper also offers some strength, and zinc is a little bit different. So while zinc also improves the mechanical properties of the amalgam, its primary purpose is as a deoxidizer. So it prevents the oxidation of the other metals in the alloy during the manufacturing process. However, if zinc is contaminated with saliva or other moisture during its placement, it can expand quite a bit. So most of today's amalgam has very little to no zinc for that reason. Of these, silver and tin are the primary alloys. Copper and zinc are added in order to alter the mechanical properties. So next we'll talk about trituration. So the capsule that contains all of this stuff that we just talked about is placed inside a mixer called a triturator or an amalgamator. And it basically shakes the capsule rapidly back and forth, and it breaks this membrane in the middle, allowing the elemental mercury to mix with the alloy powder sitting on the other side of this membrane. So this is where the Hg mixes with the Ag, if we're talking about chemical, about the chemical elements here. So Hg for mercury, Ag for silver. So there are uh, three different phases that result from this reaction of the two components of the dental amalgam. The gamma phase is considered unreacted alloy that just didn't end up reacting with the mercury. So this is our unreacted silver and tin, which is fairly strong, but we can't rely on that alone. The gamma one phase has the highest strength and corrosion resistance. So this is the matrix or the glue that holds it all together. The silver mercury that is successfully mixed together, that's exactly what we want. And finally, we have the gamma two phase, which is the weakest and is very susceptible to corrosion and creep. And creep refers to the deformation of the amalgam under compressive stress. Now I said we would talk about corrosion later on in the video, and here it is. So corrosion sounds like a bad thing, and it, it can be, but corrosion can actually be helpful in controlled amounts to help seal the margins of the restoration over time. But too much of this weak phase is not desirable for, for its mechanical properties. So this is the tin mercury phase that is known as the weakest. So for about one to two minutes after this trituration process happens, the amalgam has a formable putty-like consistency. And this is what your normal mix is going to look like. It's nice, shiny, and smooth, and can be manipulated well and delivered to the cavity preparation. Now, if it's mixed too much, it'll be warm, wet, soft, and it sets too quickly. This is known as an over-triturated mix of amalgam. On the other side, under-trituration is if it's mixed too little. 
it'll result in this dry, crumbly kind of thing that also sets too quickly. So this is when you want to load it into the cavity preparation, and this is your ideal mix. And then in the next two to four minutes, it progresses to a harder, carvable consistency. So you need metal instruments to then manipulate it. In the following hours, the amalgam reaction continues, reaching its peak strength in about 24 hours. So let's zoom back out and focus on the alloy part of the amalgam. Historically, the silver alloy used in dental amalgams had low amounts of copper in the 2 to 4% range. But over time, they added more copper, around 20%, which produced an amalgam that was stronger, it corroded less, and had better longevity at the margins. And again, some creep and some corrosion can be helpful, but too much of it causes a weakened, overall weakened amalgam and long-term failure. So this conventional low copper amalgam results in gamma, which is strong, gamma one, which is that really strong matrix, and then gamma two, which is the weak phase prone to corrosion and creep. The high copper amalgam resulted in only the gamma and gamma one phases and is therefore ideal. So the particles of the metal alloy powder can also come in various shapes. The two most commonly marketed are spherical and admixed amalgams, and these come up on the board exam quite often. So spherical contains little spheres exclusively, while admixed contains a mixture of both the spherical particles and then also these irregular lathe cut particles that you can see floating in the background of this awesome microscopic image. So the spherical amalgams are more plastic and are easier to condense, so you can use less force with the, the amalgam condenser. So this is great if you're using pins and so you can more easily condense the amalgam laterally around those pins and use the condenser to push the amalgam against the facial, lingual, mesial, and distal walls. It also sets quicker, and when it does set, it's generally stronger. The admixed amalgams require more condensation force relative to the spherical, but you get better proximal contacts with adjacent teeth. So when do we use this type of restorative material? Most people are using composite resins today, but amalgam still has a place in general dentistry. We'll talk about composite resins in the next video, but generally amalgam may be preferred by some providers for larger preparations, for heavy occlusion, and for isolation problems, where it's particularly difficult to keep the operating field dry. The rest of these you can also take a look at as well. So let's go over briefly some clinical tips here. Carving the amalgam, once it's in that a couple minutes on, that those couple minutes have passed and now it's starting to harden, we can no longer manipulate it easily and we have to use some metal instruments. Well, we talked about some of these in our third video in this series. The discoid cleoid is really great for carving some occlusal anatomy. The Hollenbach carver can also be used for that. An explorer tip, if the amalgam isn't too hard at that point, can be used for carving the occlusal embrasure. And the amalgam knife is really useful for getting rid of that pesky gingival excess on the proximal surfaces and for shaping that gingival embrasure area. Also, marginal ridge fracture is something to keep note of for amalgam. This is most common if the axiopulpal line angle is not rounded properly. We didn't have that, that excellent resistance form that we talked about in the previous video. If the marginal ridge is left too high, so it's contacting high in occlusion on the opposite teeth, the occlusal embrasure form may be incorrect. Overbulked is typically where that is. Improper removal of the matrix band when you're done with it, or overzealous carving so that the amalgam is not at that 1.5 to 2 millimeters of minimal thickness that we need for restorative longevity. 
Now Amalgam, interestingly enough, can be used for class 5 restorations, and sometimes it's actually the preferred restoration because, especially if you're close to that root surface, it can be really hard to keep these areas dry from both blood and gingival curricular fluid. So for the class 5 amalgam preparation design, we want those preparation walls to actually diverge occlusally due to the orientation of the enamel rods. Now this is opposite from what you might think. When we're talking about a class 1 restoration, we want those walls to converge and give us that much needed retention. But in this case, we want them to diverge. Otherwise, we're going to leave unsupported enamel rods if we were to converge those walls in this area. Now, what do we do for retention, though? Because we don't have retention from the walls. Well, we can use our secondary retentive features. Usually, uh, some, some people might prefer to do four corner coves. These are little coves in each of the four internal point angles of the prep. Or you can use occlusal and gingival retention grooves, or a circumferential groove that goes around the entire interior of the prep and all are equally effective for retention. And the last topic to discuss in this video that gets tested on the board exam is mercury toxicity. So I wanna be clear that amalgam is both safe and effective as a restorative material, as shown in the literature, but it's important to know about the potential hazards. So the most toxic me mechanism for mercury to enter the body is through inhalation of mercury vapors. 80% of elemental and inorganic mercury is absorbed in the lungs, and the generally accepted threshold limit for exposure to mercury vapor for a 40-hour work week is 50 micrograms per cubic meter, which is a lot. So if a spill were to occur, use a special vacuum system and then apply sulfur powder on the floor. Now, some of the main hazards in a dental setting could include a spill like this, although it's typically rare. It can include vapors released from stored materials, uh, any kind of, again, any kind of spillage during the restoration process, and just vapor exposure during removal and polishing of an amalgam restoration. So how to, how to avoid those things? It's recommended to work in a well-ventilated space to use pre-capsulated mercury in an amalgamator with a closed hood. So um, that's referring to this area of the machine being closed over the mixing process. And if a spill is to occur, to again use a special protocol. Some things that go along with acute mercury toxicity, muscle weakness, loss of hair, weight loss or gastrointestinal problems, and exhaustion. And there are three forms of mercury to know for the board exam. And usually they will ask, and the answer will be this one, that methyl mercury is um, the most toxic one. So this is if you get exposure to the organic form of mercury. And this is typically occurring from digestion of seafood. So this is not related to dental mercury at all, but it is the most toxic form. The other thing they can ask about is just what's the mercury form that's present in dental amalgam? And that's this liquid metallic mercury that is present in the dental amalgam. Again, if we're going back to that Eames ratio, 50% will be that silver alloy also containing copper and zinc and tin. The other 50% is going to be this elemental liquid metallic mercury. And finally, we have mercury salts which are the third stage, the third form of amalgam, and that's the inorganic form. All right, so that's all you need to know for amalgams on the board exam, and that's it for this video. So thank you so much for watching, everyone. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry coming soon. If you're interested in supporting this channel and what I do, please check out my Patreon page, Thank you to Michael Raja, Reb Boyd, Rhea Wadwa, Jonathan Muff, Eric DiMatteo, Alexa Klunder, Jonathan Nguyen, David Jaden, Isabella Caldas, Ali Benchjir, Badir Hefnawi, and all of my patrons for their support. 
You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exam. So go check that out. The link will be in the description below this video. Thanks again for watching everyone and I'll see you in the next video.